Uh, my name is Sanna, and this is Riku, my colleague. We are from Gispo. Uh, uh, and hope you are all uh, fresh. Last speak of the day, so bear with me. Uh, Gispo is a consultancy company in, in Finland, we have, and also in Sweden. We have 25 employees, and uh, we do lots of open source stuff. So with all the open source tools available and suitable for the customers. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about land use planning and what is happening in, in Finland. There's a beautiful map projected nicely uh, in the picture. And the idea uh, in the land use planning scene is that you have to provide the land use plans to national registry soon. Uh, there are 309 municipalities at the moment in, in Finland, small, small municipalities, and 18 regions or provinces. Uh, so you have thousands of data sets lying around somewhere at the moment. Uh, the national law was changing this year. Uh, from the beginning of this year, you have to uh, put the legally binding land use plans to this national system called Ryhti. I'm not going to translate it in English, but it's the jar there, Ryhti jar. Uh, and you have five, time, five years time to provide the data sets, the new, new le legally binding data sets to Ryhti. Uh, and the idea is that the, the data must be validated and pass around 190 validation rules at the moment. So uh, a bit like the topological map uh, planning at the moment in National Land Survey, there are lots of rules we have uh, in the la la land use planning exactly as difficult task to do. And the uses of for this data then in the when when it's harmonized, it's going to be what whoever wants to use it. The uh, tax authority needs it, the government needs it, industry needs it, investors, users, citizens, whoever. But it's going to be harmonized the data uh, when when this project is finalized. And our, our part in the pro project is that we have had, uh, we have two like these testing projects going on and we are going to test how the uh, phosphor tools are uh, behaving, how can we do this land use plan in the future so that it passes all those 190 validation rules and more. So there aren't no land use planning tools at the moment in the uh, proprietary uh, side or the open source side that can achieve this at the moment. Yeah, uh, just to tell you about what is a land use plan, you have an area, polygon land use area, and then you have different kind of information attached to that area. Uh, you have the li life cycle of the land use plan, you have different kind of decisions, reports, papers. Then you have, have the land use parcels, uh, like areas, points, lines, maybe 3D objects. And then you have different kind of regulations that are attached to those areas or points or lines. And those regulations have additional information about the regulations. Uh, and then you have an organization who has done the land use planning and you have different source data and so forth. So, ah, sorry, I can't go back for it with that. So in, this is a simple <laughs> model, but you can go and see the actual uh, not so simple model <laughs> in, the, in the background. But now, Riku. Okay, thank you, Sanna. So uh, I'm kind of responsible for the technology side in this prototype. So I mean, the our idea was to just create, I mean, the simplest possible infrastructure with which there's this land use planner who looks slightly afraid and who's Jana Sanna drawn for us. And and the idea is that they just need to make their plans so that they are end up in the national registry. And and I I had to figure out like like the simplest way of 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 doing this. So the idea is that, that uh, 
the planner will just use no no okay oh yeah so the idea is that the planner will just use QGIS for their work and and then the databases are at the moment we are doing it on on Amazon web services because we are trying trying it trying whether cloud services could do it and and then there has to be has to be a, a as I said, tunneling server or some other means of identification because you can't like open a open a database to the public because I mean we need to be a able to identify who are the people who actually have access to the database. But our in, in our test case, the idea was, was that there all of the rest of the thing happens in in Amazon Web Services. So then there's uh, apparently that's supposed to be me, Sandra Drone Meal, who is the developer who has to be able to like fast fast uh, change the database schema and add things to the database and and so on, so then you have to have some scripts on, on Amazon AWS, AWS that, that update the database whenever the schema is changed so that if the land use planet there needs like something like new tables or whatever, or new fields in the, in the, in the database and so on, it, it will, you c it's, it's fast to add them because the data model is certain to evolve and it has evolved a lot. And in addition to the evolving data model, then what we need is lots of uh, what Sana mentioned, the national regulations, which basically, uh, but national regulations mean that you have a huge amount of different national code lists that are approved by the Ministry of Environment, and, and, and all the time the up-to-date national code lists are provided by the Digital and Population Data Services Agents in Finland, who host an API for all the national code lists and registries, so, like, so it, that, that API has like up-to-date. So whenever, whenever, for example, a new type of regulation is, is comes into the code list and the, and then the planners need to do it so this basically updates updates it daily so that whenever new types of regulations and any new 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 things that are like this types of decisions and stuff like that lots of different detailed codes so then if, whenever it's updated to the national code list then the land user planner will see the updated updated codes in their QGIS form and will be able to speak the new regulations once once it's added to national code lists and then what's missing or what's, what needs to be done after that is then actually to try to transfer the stuff somehow to the national reg registries. So first of all, uh, uh, the Finnish uh, environmental agency is the, company, is, the, is the one responsible for actual, the actual national APIs that have to be provided, the, the data. And they are offering a public API for validating this data that Sana explained because as, as she said, there are like 100 or 200 or more counting at the moment validation rules that the data has to pass before be, before being like a valid plan that that can have a legal effect in the future so what what is done is is that constantly our database is basically we take all the plans in the database and every 15 minutes we validate everything that's contained in the database so that uh, then we we know whether I mean, some of those plans are obviously only drafts and they're not valid plans yet, but the idea is that whenever the plan planner is working, they can see like the status of their, their, their plan so that, so that the, the latest validation result for their plan is saved in the database then. So then they can figure out what's wrong with my plan. Usually it's some regulations missing, some, some like parcels are missing, some like polygons might be missing. On the, on then there's a logical conflict between regulations because there are lots of rules like if you have a regulation like this you have to have information like this and you have information like this uh, but you're missing the regulation and so on so it's a huge huge web of like like validation rules so basically the easiest way to do it is to just validate it constantly with the open API and then uh, finally you have to be able to provide the data that will become law in the future uh, to the to the national APIs, and because it's it's going to be like legally binding data, so you have to have some way of knowing that it comes from from a, the right source. So you it can't be an open API. It has to be an API that somehow where you really authenticate somehow, and that's why in Finland they use nowadays quite popularly uh, this technology called X-Road, which is originally a, an Estonian thing, which has been developed in Estonia for like 20 years already. And I think the, much of the Finnish and the Estonian government or administration runs on X-Road. And it, the idea is that you have security servers, uh, all, all, like, all, all the public institutions have security servers that are authenticated and they have signatures provided by the digital agency so that everybody knows that those servers are, have the signature, they are signed, that they are certified to be owned by the agency, agency they claim to be. 
So then luckily there is, it's open source and there is a Docker, Docker version of it which we can easily, easily put up in the same internal network on, on the cloud as all the other services. And then once you have, have registered your, your server with the digital services agency, then after that you can basically post stuff from the APIs. First you convert the contents of the, AP, of the database to a JSON that's of the right format, and then you basically have to post it through the local security server container, and the security server takes care of the rest. So what the security server does is, is all, it's timestamps and authorizes and, and signs that it is, this is approved by the security server, and then it goes on to the national, national uh, environmental agency. So this is kind of the simplest way I figured out. Are you hearing me with or without a microphone? No. But anyway, this is kind of the simplest way I figured out we could do it just using cloud services. And also the database has been simplified for, for regional plan uses because, because actually the R database is a bit simpler than the official national data model. So then Sanna will talk to you more about the data model, I think. Yeah, so this is the simplified version. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the idea, what the user sees is curious. Uh, sh she or he doesn't know, have to know anything of what's happening in the back background. So uh, we have two use cases, one with the forms, QGIS forms, and another one coming up uh, with plugins. and. Uh, since we have just started the plugin project, I'll show you some images from the QGIS Forms project, as to say. So here is a QGIS project, and luckily QGIS knows how to do these uh, wonderful attribute forms, and we can do lots of things with them. I don't know if you have used ever QGIS Forms, but they are really, really good and powerful. Uh, but then when you have quite complex uh, database in the background uh, and quite many relations, uh, it becomes a bit tedious uh, for the user to have uh, tape relation tables within relation tables and so forth. Uh, and then uh, there are lots of rules, as, as you, we mentioned. So the attribute feature design can get you only to one, one point, and um, this leaves for the user a lot of, uh, you have to understand what you're doing, so it's, it's not very uh, nice in the end. But this is uh, the, as far as we have gone now, and um, uh, the next phase is to check more in, de in deep to the regulations. So. Every land use uh, point or polygon or line uh, uh, has to have these land use regulation groups. It might be have just one land use regulation or it might have many. But in case of windmills, for example, you are planning a windmill area. You have to have, according to the national uh, uh, legislations at the moment, you have to have uh, information if it's a sub-region or, uh, or uh, this like uh, uh, energy supply area that is adjusted to be a windmill area. So if it's a po polygon, you can be a sub-area. Uh, if it's a point geometry, you must include information if the location is fixed or not. That's one regulation. Then uh, you can have uh, another line of information about the amount of windmills. Uh, points do not have amount of windmills, only polygons have. Uh, then for polygons and points, you can have the height and unit of the uh, windmills. And if you use this, uh, then you have to also have a reg verbal regulation that what states that where the height is calculated. So windmill height is calculated from sea level, for example. So you have to have like a, in this case, four different regulations for points and uh, areas a bit differently. So you see the QGIS forms uh, might struggle a little bit if you want to have this kind of uh, structure there. 
So next phase is uh, plugin design, and we haven't started it yet. So this is the first version. <laughs> first version. If a user adds an area, you add this kind of information. If the user adds a point, then you have different kind of information. And this this is the difference about the how to uh, uh, like uh, guide the user to do the things they want. So pros and cons using QGIS forms versus plugin. We are I might have more list uh, in the list in the plugin side after uh, say let's say six months. But the attribute forms are very easy to and fast to test and create create things for the client to test. Just test that the, if something works. Uh, no coding needed, so <laughs> any anybody can do it. You don't need to be a, a developer. Uh, it works quite okay nowadays with uh, different kind of relations, and uh, they are I, I like them. But uh, there there are some problems. Editing order is important to set and think what is the order the the user will edit these different forms, uh, and he has to, uh, they they have to know which uh, tables they have to edit first, and that, that's not very intuitive uh, always. Uh, and it does not fit well to a situation where the attribute data feeding has lots of rules. That if you do this, then you have to do this. But if you do that, you have to do different thing. But we are thinking about the plugging for this. Uh, and. Uh, when well planned, it should guide the user how to create the data. Uh, and it needs a lot of UE testing and user testing uh, and so forth. And they probably have to download the plugin separately. Maybe it could be set to the profile, I don't know. But you can give, give us ideas on what's good and what's not in these two, two methods. But yes, in the end, Force4G tools are the superhero here. We are, uh, this is an opportunity for Force4G uh, community uh, in Finland to, uh, to start using QGIS because uh, municipalities at the moment, they have hybrid solutions, maybe more, more nowadays a QGIS is, is coming uh, to, into use, but these land use plans, they have to do it some way and uh, PostGIS and QGIS might be the uh, answer. So there's the Phosphor-G superhero who is crunching the paper, paper maps into this machine and then it harmonized data will flow after this. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and question. Thank you for uh, explanation. Um, uh, I was wondering if you were um, familiar with the development in the Netherlands uh, where um, by law uh, they are working on a similar uh, digitalization of um, uh, spatial planning as also uh, in law. Uh, and uh, for example, I'm from a province and for us it's obligatory uh, since the 1st of January this year. So we have developed an open source solution for this. Uh, but one of the problems and one of the um, questions I have about uh, how it's in Finland is this phenomenon you call the uh, national code lists. Yeah. Um, uh, is it by any uh, way standardized so that you can uh, read it in and translate to these forms? or? What kind of yeah. format are these? They're, okay, yeah. Well, basically, yeah, they're, they're JSON and lots of it. So, and, and it's all standardized. So, basically, all the codes have like set fields. They have like a value and a URL for the code so you can refer to it. Because obviously, new code lists will come up and old code lists will disappear. So, each code list has like, their own URA, which won't change. And each code has their own URA at the end of the code list. And then that, that gives you kind of the, the permanent address of this certain regulation or this certain code that won't change. And they are, I think they are all translated in Finnish, Swedish, and English. 
so basically they have names and then they also have descriptions of what this regulation or this specific code is meant to be used for and what does this mean because there are hundreds and thousands of different codes corresponding to different regulations and not, but so but the whole code list uh, code list uh, is it's also in English so basically there you can browse all the national registries and code lists there are actually hundreds of them and in here we are only using like a dozen or 20 or something like that so we are using a small minority of all the national code lists available out there so I guess it's been standardized quite far in Finland in that regard yeah, yeah I, have, I have maybe like a million questions sorry I come out yeah 